The world of modern yacht design is a world fueled by technology, a world driven by a constant search for speed in the relentless pursuit of the elusive winning edge. Boats get bigger, faster, lighter, stronger, leaving in their wake a fleet of one-time cutting edge, now all but obsolete racing has been. It's hard to imagine these boats racing together in over 100 years' time. But the race machines of yesteryear, they are as big a crowd pleaser now as they were over a century ago. This month on Main Sail, we're going back in time to look at the charm and allure of the classics, race boats that must surely rank as some of the most beautiful yachts ever built. The French Riviera has long been a favourite holiday destination for Europe's jet set, and the very heart of glitterati holiday heaven is without doubt the ancient fortress stronghold of Saint-Tropez. In the late 1950s, the town famously provided the setting for the film and God Created Woman, the movie that rocketed a certain Brigitte Bardot to international stardom. Bordeaux's role in the film made this town an almost instant hotspot with Europe's parting elite. It was the Ibiza of its day. If you were young, rich and beautiful in 1960s Europe, this is where you came to party. 60 years on from the release of the film that changed this modest little town, the name Saint-Tropez still exudes continental style and Mediterranean chic but it's no longer just a destination for the beautiful people. For several years now, Saint-Tropez has been attracting some of the world's most beautiful race boats to sail in a very special regatta. Laval de Saint-Tropez is an annual celebration that regularly attracts over 300 racing yachts to compete in an end of season regatta that sees some of the oldest yachts still racing out on the water with some of the sport's most avant-garde designs. It's a well-attended celebration of sailing. Over 4,000 sailors annually take part. And here in Saint-Tropez, it's an established event, hosted perfectly in what must be one of the most idyllic settings in our sport. It's a beautiful town. It's a, it's a place where there's a lot of life during the day, a lot of people on the piers, uh, a lot of parties at night. So it's, it's a great mix, you know. Um, and, and it's great sailing also. So it's a unique event for sure in the world. Saint-Tropez is uh, an, an iconic place. It's, it's a perfect écrin, the little box for the diamond, very well situated. It's not just the, the unknown of the weather that you get in Saint-Tropez with the change of the seasons, but it's the beauty. When you have this incredibly beautiful port, tiny port, filled up with the classic boats, it all fits. At the end of the season, it's the perfect way to finish the, finish the year. The origins of the regatta lie in a challenge between two boats, which raced against each other out from Saint-Tropez, around a mark and back to land. The finish of that original challenge was here, Saint-Tropez famous at Club 55. And from that original contest in 1981, this magnificent regatta was born. The boats that will be sailing here come together in as diverse a racing fleet as you could possibly imagine. Brand new Italian designed state of the art super yachts represent the real avant garde boats of the sailing world. But while the sleek modern designs are to be admired, for me the real stars are the classics. In a fleet of over 100 classic yachts, 26 of them were built over 100 years ago. This fleet really is steeped in history. At the beginning of the 1900s, these race boats were the race boats of their time. Sleek, fast, beautifully designed. It's incredible to think that over 100 years on, they're still out there racing. Twiga, owned by Prince Albert of Monaco, and this week in the safe hands of his nephew is one of four 15-metre class race boats here. 
Between the start of the 1900s and the First World War, these boats were at the forefront of competitive sailing. Sadly, only four of them survived that turbulent period of European history. But they are in immaculate condition and sail as well now as they did back then. They were so well built, they were built for one purpose, just for racing. And you can really still feel it now. It's, it's really pleasurable and the boats are very similar, so we're quite close to each other. And it's a real race. When you're there, you're, everyone's fighting to win. This fleet, the 15 meters, are arguably the most uh, beautiful uh, racing boats ever built. And racing these boats is a really big privilege. I mean, it's, it's like a time machine, you know? Getting on board these boats and, and knowing that they were raced really hard. On the dock, these 15 meter class boats look beautiful. Their immaculately varnished wood and polished brass as carefully looked after today as they were 100 years ago. But it's only out on the water. When you see these stunning race boats in all their glory, that you really see their true beauty. Later in the programme, we'll be looking at some of the bigger boats and I'll be taking on the unique challenge that gave birth to this extraordinary regatta. But before then, let's take a quick look at what else has been going on in the sailing world this month. In the offshore classic, the Rolex Middle Sea Race, a 606 nautical mile route that starts and ends in the Grand Harbour in Malta, first across the finish line was George Davies' Rambler 88, who took their third consecutive win. But overall victory was claimed by Igor Rytov and his all-Russian crew on board Bogotá. For the first time since it was dramatically won in Bermuda in June, the America's Cup left New Zealand soil and was paraded in China in initial overtures to attract a Chinese entry to the next edition. Members of the winning Emirates Team New Zealand sailing team took part in the China Cup and perhaps no surprise that it was the Kiwis who won. It's been a busy few weeks at the Volvo Ocean Race, both on and off the water. Changes in the boardroom and a very public battle over leadership of one of the teams has not overshadowed the start of this legendary round the world race. The fleet are by now well on their way to Cape Town and we'll be bringing you the inside story from the race in a couple of months time here on Mainsail. This month on Mainsail, we're on the French Riviera with some of the most beautiful sailboats ever built as they race in a unique regatta that really does turn back time. There are over 100 classics competing here in Saint-Tropez. They're all the real race boats of their day. Over 20 of them are boats that are over 100 years old. And they're out here racing exactly as they did all those years ago. Many of the classic race boats here were simply built to go fast. There's boats that were built to win the Olympics. There's boats that were built to contest the America's Cup. But when you think of today's modern race boats, it's hard to imagine they'll still be around in over a century's time. I'm really attracted by the brains who designed that kind of stuff a century ago. How they were drawing, thinking, trying to explore without any tank test or something, just like that, you know, piece of paper and I'm drawing a boat. And in a few months, I built it. They were really quick. All four of the 15-metre class yachts here in Saint-Tropez were the brainchild of just one man. Designed and built on the River Clyde in Scotland, these race thoroughbreds represent some of the finest work by the famous Scottish naval architect, William Fife III. At the start of the 1900s, William Fife was a third generation Scottish boat builder, making a name for himself as one of the premier race boat designers of his age. He designed over 600 boats, has a place in the America's Cup Hall of Fame, and is responsible for some of the most stylish race boats ever crafted. William Fife was um, certainly the most respected yacht designer in Europe, or among the most respected yacht designers. He was well known for you know, extraordinary beauty and perfect proportions of the boat. Um, but hand in hand with that came workmanship at the yard, where you know, the joinery and the craftsmanship was second to none. 
William Fife was a designer who not only uh, was able to make his boat uh, his boats very fast, but also very beautiful, which is uh, remarkable because you will never see a, a Fife boat which isn't uh, exceptionally pretty. And I think that's very difficult because I think he uh, other, other designers of, of, the, of the time were able to make fast boats, but not as pretty. The Clyde was the river of industry. I mean, it was phenomenal wealth among the Clyde. The largest shipyards in the world were, were on the Clyde. Um, so, you know, he was also lucky to have the clientele who could afford the boats that he designed. But the prolific Scottish yacht designer didn't limit himself to small racing boats. At 40 metres in length, Cambria is the biggest classic in the fleet here in Saint Tropez and must be one of William Fife's finest creations. We are all very, very much uh, in awe of William Fife. His lines, he may not have had the fastest boat, just sometimes they were, sometimes weren't, but he certainly always had the most beautiful, most elegant. And I think because of his eye for detail and his eye for beauty, that's why you now see 80% of William Fife's here in Saint Tropez this year. Talking to the skipper and crew of Cambria, the love and respect for this boat is almost overwhelming. At nearly 90 years old, she's not the oldest yacht here in Saint Tropez, but out sailing on the race course, it really is like stepping back in time. Originally built for a British newspaper tycoon in the late 1920s, from a sailing perspective, Cambria was an out-and-out -out racing machine. At her peak, she was competing in up to 50 races a year. She was sailed hard and sailed fast. And although the atmosphere on board today is no doubt a lot less intense, you can really sense her racing pedigree. At 122 tonnes, Cambria needs a lot of power to race fast. Her sail area, it's just vast. But despite her weight, on board, she really feels like a race thoroughbred. In the right hands, she's still as glorious today as she would have been as a newly built cutting edge racing boat. Much to our original owner's delight, in our first ever competitive foray back in 1928, Cambria crossed the finish line in first place, a feat she's still capable of today, 89 years later. They were like the maxis of today, no different. Designed and built to win races, and win races in the largest class, in the most prestigious class. That, that's, that was what she was built for, no, no question about it. I think if we were to, to grab one of the sailors who was sailing on her back in 1928 and, and transfer on a time machine to the future, that sailor would be on Comanche. Comanche being the, the fastest, highest performance yacht kicking around in our time of a similar size. There's a very long-standing tradition on board Cambria. After a great day out in the water, you fire the cannon. The action here in Saint-Tropez continues in part three, when I take to the helm of one of these magnificent classics in a very particular race which echoes the original challenge upon which this unique regatta was built. This month's mainsail sees us in stunning Saint-Tropez as the French Riviera hosts some of the world's oldest racing yachts still sailing. This particular regatta annually sees these wonderful classics gather here in the south of France to compete in a week of racing that celebrates both the history and tradition of the sport. Although many of the classics here are well over 100 years old, the regatta itself has rather more modern origins it's actually the evolution of a challenge initiated between two yachts in the very early 1980s. And at the heart of the regatta's origins is that Saint-Tropez hotspot, Club 55. At the end of September 1981, Dick and Celia Jason, who were the owners of a small swan called Pride, decided to take a break in Saint-Tropez for the first time. At that moment, the 12-meter Ikra entered the port and Dick, in a sudden burst of spontaneity, said, I'm even capable of beating a boat like this. Are you, Dick? I asked. Yes, I am, he said. 
And as the owners of Ypres were friends of mine, I went to see them straight away and I asked, would you take part in a regatta between Pride and Ypres tomorrow? Yes, of course, they replied. Let's sail from Saint-Tropez to Club 55 and we'll call the race the Club 55 Cup and it'll just be for fun. The Ikra, she didn't have the sails that when my dad saw her during the uh, week were not that great. And he figured, you know, I can beat that old boat. And then it was funny, on the race day, uh, Ikra came out with all these uh, sails that she'd gotten from some other 12-meter boats, and they were like faster sails. In the end, it was really just a fun competition. Et le, le journal local, the next day, the local newspaper ran the headline, A New America's Cup is Born. It was impressive. The following year, the Jasons returned with pride, and Dick was craving revenge. So we staged the race again, but this time we included another dozen boats. The regatta has grown significantly since those early days. As Patrice is famous for saying, it's only when you do things over and over that you create nostalgia. And nowhere is that more evident than at an event born out of a single challenge to race. The spirit of that original challenge still lives on today. Each boat can challenge a rival to a duel, a race around the bay, and back in time for lunch. And we're getting involved. I'm going to be steering this beautiful little slip. I'll be taking on the challenge here on this feisty 22-foot sloop Alcyon. But before we start, there's a slight confession to make. Alcyon wasn't built until 2013, but she qualifies because she is an exact 100% replica of a race boat built back in 1871. At the middle of the uh, 18th century, starting uh, to have regatta, and in our family, the great-grandfather of my wife has been uh, a very good sailor, and uh, he wanted to also uh, to take part of those regattas, so it took him uh, a few years to find out how to make the best boat he could imagine, and eventually uh, he arrived with other friends to this kind of boat, which is uh, quite special. Rebuilding that boat has been from paintings only. My wife Edith also has done a lot of work looking at the archives, old books with friends. It's really a family adventure. With a width more than half of that of her length and an end of boom to bowsprit length that doubles her measurement, the origins of this little racing machine are fascinating. Her real ancestry lies in the radical American East Coast oyster catchers of the mid-19th century, which inspired the creation of a unique class of Marseille racing boat. Once on the helm myself, though, I was straight into race mode. This is really lovely. She's a little beauty. She's so light and powerful. As soon as there is any wind, we're off like a rocket. I think we're going to have a great day. OK, we're racing. Yeah, good start, team. Still turning. Jib on. Let's go with the jib. That's our opposition, and we're just ahead. The other boat's behind. It's exciting really, really lovely. The weird thing for me is, though, that everything is so flexible. I keep wanting to pull all the sails on and on and on. But you don't sail a classic like that. You just let it all go. Just about to finish. Second. Pretty happy with that. Yeah. Well done, everyone. Bravo. <laughs> Bravo. Custom should suggest that we would finish our afternoon amongst the champagne and rosé of Club 55. But the crew of Alcyon are about building their own traditions. So after a successful second place, my host celebrated with a peaceful afternoon picnic. Meanwhile, festivities at Club 55 are a little more energetic. The owners and crew of Savannah have clinched the prestigious Club 55 trophy. And as tradition dictates, celebrations are extensive. Reveling in the history of this regatta here at Club 55, it's easy to forget that there is a serious side to this event here. Out on the water, after a full week of racing, results do count. 
In what must be the most beautiful class of yacht racing there is, the Grand Tradition, it was the stunning Moonbeam 3 that took the win. Cambria failed to make the podium, but with Halloween in second, it was a 1-2 finish for the Master of Design, William Fife. And as we've already seen, the most competitive class in the classics here in Saint-Tropez is the 15-metre class. Four boats, each one designed and built in the early 1900s, still outracing each other today as they did over 100 years ago. It's an impressive sight watching these boats turn back the years. It was Mariska that ended up taking first place after an unforgettable week of racing. It's always amazing to have these four boats. Uh, Saint-Tropez now has a specific regatta just for us, so we're really uh, fighting with no handicap. And uh, no, it's been, uh, once again, absolutely amazing. We won Saint-Tropez and it also concludes an amazing season for us because we won the season. It is wonderful to see not only how these boats still race competitively, but also how the captains and crews continue to perform the same traditions that have been taking place for the last century. And it is not ridiculous to hope that these beautiful race boats could still be racing and celebrating like this in a hundred years' time. If a boat is capable to bring so much joy and so much fun 90 years in a row, you know, you've done well. Even if she didn't win all the races that he wanted her to win, who cares? You, you have an owner, you have a crew, you have friends who come sailing and have the time of their life. If she's uh, lived for, for uh, more than 100 years, I, I hope that she'll live at least uh, 200 years. In, in life, you don't get very often to do this, you know, and this is the kind of thing that really makes you live and say, you know, this is, I'm a real privileged person to be able to, 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 to steer this boat. Even in 100 years, it will be a beautiful boat to race and to sail, and, and I just hope we can pass on our knowledge to the next a generation that will sail on the boat and that to make sure that what we do here is not forgotten.